Hi, and welcome back to our GCP Mindset channel and all things clinical research. This is part two of our ongoing webinar series on risk-based monitoring. And in the first part, we have talked about what risk-based monitoring is, as well as the regulations that govern it. And this time around, we want to dive into the different components of risk-based monitoring, and specifically also how centralized statistical monitoring can gain a lot of insight into your data and help your monitoring approach. So without further ado, let's start. Now, once more to briefly summarize this, um, and then I want to jump into details more of it, so on statistical monitoring, because that's probably a little bit more out there. So risk-based monitoring is basically a way of adjusting the frequency and intensity, as well as the type of monitoring that we do. And it's rationalized based on risk factors that you determine beforehand and that you monitor during the conduct of your trial. Monitor and adapt, that is. Additionally, it combines, of course, different types of monitoring approaches. Uh, so as we saw before, on-site monitoring, remote monitoring, and statistical means or centralized statistical monitoring approaches. On-site monitoring, of course, in a lot of cases is source data verification, is source data review to ensure that GCP compliance is, for example, in line, and a lot of unreported issues can be identified through it. I'm not saying on-site monitoring should not be used. This is not the message that should be taken away from this. I'm just saying that there are alternatives to it and that all of the monitoring strategies have their place. And if you use them well, and if you combine them well, then you can have a real benefit on quality of your study data. Of course, one of the things that also on-site monitoring does very well, and that to some extent, of course, can still be done remotely, is supporting the site, keeping the motivation high, engaging with the study site, identifying issues that you may be otherwise unaware of. Lastly, or second to last, we have remote monitoring, which is basically in Europe, remote so uh, data review. Um, in other places, you could also do remote source data review, uh, in Europe, primarily because of data protection regulations, only secondary data can be assessed. And the real benefit here is that you have also standardization across study sites. If you have a multinational study, you, you would usually have multiple monitors, one per country or multiple ones per country. And there's really benefits to having one centralized team that can do a, an, an analysis and a review of data across all study sites. Also, of course, it is more time and cost efficient because you do not need to travel to the site and you are not as restricted by the conditions you find at the site, but rather you can ensure that you have the tools and the settings ready as you need. Now, let's come to statistical monitoring. And that may be something that uh, some or uh, more of you are less familiar with. The idea is still the same. We have a study site, which is you know, an investigator, but realistically it's, it's a study nurse or study coordinator that manages most of the clinical trial, collects the clinical data and enters it into the electronic data capture system. Uh, this electronic data capture system and electronic data capture overall, of course, is a prerequisite. It's a must have for running risk-based monitoring, but I would argue that you cannot really run clinical trials these days without electronic data capture, because otherwise regulators would probably tell you that you do not uphold the requirements for overseeing your trial data as a sponsor. So assuming that's available, you can then have on-site or remote monitoring uh, through a clinical research associate. Uh, it's an expert, of course, who oversees the review of study data, visits the study site and reports to the sponsor or the CRO. But now in between, we put additional steps. From the data that is recorded at the study site, we basically feed this into a centralized system and you use tools to process and analyze this collected, uh, collected study data and generate basically statistical summaries on it. And you then use probability to assess whether some values are suspicious and whether they should be followed up upon or if the values are expected and you do not need to monitor them more closely. And I will go into the details and examples also in the next slides. The next step is then to do a central evaluation 
that can be done through a biostatistician, it can be done to, through an experienced data manager or dedicated site personnel. Uh, we, for example, use remote clinical data monitors that are specifically trained in this process. And they manage this analyzed as well as the raw data. They identify issues that are reported automatically through centralized statistical monitoring and then clarify these with the monitors or directly with the study sites. And of course, in the end, what it should lead to is a feedback loop which feeds back the information to the study site. We can do clarifications remotely through queries, through calls, through emails, or by accumulating things and issues and having a CRA follow-up during the next on-site visit in case this is required. So how does it look like and which sort of analysis can we do in statistical monitoring? The first one is on patient level, basically. You can look at each individual data point within a patient and through just visually presenting all of them and having a tool flag those that are outliers, you can immediately draw attention to the ones that should be followed up on. And now while it may seem rather obvious in this example, the ones that are very high or very low, that they would be unexpected and are flagged for it, you do see that in the central mix, you do have individual data points which are considered suspicious, whereas other ones are not. And this is really the strength of, of statistical monitoring because it can do simultaneously a lot of comparisons. Comparisons within one study site, across study sites, between visits, and with other data of the same visit. And while you can also do this in a manual process, it is very difficult and you need to be really at 100% of your game to identify issues and you need to recall information of prior patients that you have looked at. And just doing this automatically is of course a great benefit because it reduces the amount of errors. And of course, I think this image also visualizes just the impact on the, on the resource saving we have. If you only look at the six red highlighted dots in this picture, and compare it to the 150 other information points that you see on here as a parameter, it is very easy for you to see if you had to review everything, it would be a lot of work. And if you only need to look at six values and you can find a rationale why you only look at six values, then of course that's amazing for you. It's amazing for, uh, for the quality of the data. And it's of course good to streamline the process within the trial. Now, where it also extremely shines, and this is where it becomes very difficult for, for uh, individual to perform, is when you compare information on a site level, systematically comparing it between different study sites. And I've brought two examples here. Uh, one, you see on the, where is my mouse? Here's my mouse. Uh, one is where you see sort of like a site you're looking at. This is the site that is under your care. And the second line is basically the frequency you observe in all other study sites combined. And what you can see here on the left already is that there is a distinct difference. In this particular case, we are looking at a baseline assessment on the physical status of a patient. And we could identify that almost all of the patients included into the clinical trial were physically impaired because that was the expected study population. Of course, there were opportunities to also include patients in which this was not as pronounced, but primarily these patients were included in the trial. Now we have one clinical study site, the one that we are looking at, in which the ratio in which patients are physically impaired as they are enrolled in the clinical trial is much lower. Is this wrong? Well, that has to be determined by the sponsor, by the medical monitor, but for sure you can tell that it is extraordinary, it is unexpected, and it could lead to issues in the analysis of your clinical trial. As a monitor, only of this one study site, you would see an overall low frequency of physically impaired patients enrolled in the trial, and you would deem it normal because that's representative for the site that you're looking at. All monitors going to other sites would see a very high frequency and would never know of your study sites potentially. And so here it's very easy to show. The second example here on the slide is actually a cumulative curve of the number of adverse events that are reported at a study site. So you can see that overall in the trial, 
relatively few adverse events were reported from start uh, of the screening phase to treatment to end of treatment. And at this study site, a lot of adverse events were reported. And these are actual case cases. So this is, I mean, not made up. This is something we can observe in our clinical trials. And adverse event over or under reporting is critical to evaluating a cl clinical, cl clinical trial. Regulators will look at this and they may ask you or they may ask the sponsor to revisit the study sites and identify whether they have reported way too much or whether they have reported way too little. So for sure, you would like to keep information on the status of adverse event reporting at prior sites. And here we would have to go and discuss whether either the procedure is not carried out well at the study site and therefore they have a lot of adverse events. That's something you can, for example, expect in medical device trials, which are a lot dependent also on the experience of the surgeon, for example. Or if they are just much more sensitive to potential adverse events and are much quicker to report, whereas everyone else in, this, in the trial does not report it as much. And this is very difficult to discern when you're only looking at one study site and very easy if you're looking at multiple ones. And then as a final example, you can also use central statistical monitoring methods to detect fraud. On a site level, on a trial level, you can identify whether data has been manipulated, whether data has been generated in a way that uh, yeah, certain results are portrayed, which you wouldn't expect, uh, or where patients weren't actually real. And you may consider that this shouldn't happen too often, but actually there are a lot of studies on this as well. Um, and two that I have in mind uh, state that the reported amount of uh, made up data, let's say, or fraudulent data lies between 0.01%, which would be on the very low end, to 0.4%. And 0.4% is actually already a lot. I mean, that is already one in almost 200 patients is entirely made up. That's basically the reported amount. And of course, we would expect that the rate is higher, but maybe less was detected. These are just confirmed cases. So although we would like to assume that everything is going splendidly well, there is a real danger of data being manipulated and made up, especially if you have very large clinical trials. And there are a lot of tools with which you can identify these from a statistical point of view. For example, number preferences, in liars, that means values that are always too perfect. You can also compare patient profiles, and if they are too identical, you could follow up. And there are a lot of more methods that you can do. And this is also where this centralized assessment shines and where it can support your risk narrative. If you don't see any red flags, you can reduce monitoring activity at a study site. But if you do see some, then it is worth spending monitoring visits to dig deeper into the potential issues. And if everything is fine, then it's good. Otherwise, you may just detect any issues that you had otherwise not known. All right, that's the end of part two of our webinar series on risk-based monitoring. We hope you enjoyed it and that you learned a lot about the components of risk-based monitoring. Please subscribe to not miss out on the next video and drop your comment below. Yeah.